I explained it to him and everything, and the little says, man, do you realize you win the gold medal, what'll happen? He be the talk of the town. So like, ain't no. His eyes lit up, you know, and he saw. <laughs> the 1968 Olympics were only a year away, but Doc promised to make George one hell of a boxer and entered him in half a dozen fights. George won all of them, and Doc kept pushing his career and persuaded the ring announcer to put George's picture in the paper before an upcoming fight. First time I'd ever heard his name. George was brand new. He had only been in a boxing ring for a couple of months at that time. And uh, he was fighting a man who was a professional amateur by the name of Clay Hodges. George lost to Clay Hodges, a much smaller fighter. And boy, it was embarrassing. I said to myself, I'll never do this again. I walked back to the dressing room, and here's George sitting on the rubbing table uh, with his chin literally on his chest. The word sad in the dictionary, that was George. And I patted him on those massive shoulders and said, you know, pat, pat, pat. Don't worry about it, George. You're going to be a good fighter someday. So George kept fighting and subsequently knocked out all his opponents. With his devastating punch, he accumulated the remarkable record of 16 victories in 18 fights. And the 19-year-old fighter earned a berth on the U.S. Olympic boxing team. It looked as if he might amount to something after all. You are watching George Foreman, part of Knockout Week on Biography. Rain, stop. Traffic, you. CD, play. Climate control, on. The Infinity Q45, with voice-activated controls. Lights, green. The rest of the world should be so accommodating. The new Q, from Infinity. Well, if you're watching a great drama, you get everything. Drama is life and the characters that uh, fill life. Do you get love, war, crime, fear? Not enough donuts at the craft service table. Drama has to have its points, has to have its high points and its low points, and it has to have some sort of rhythm to it. It's pretty dramatic. It's all those ingredients kind of coiled like a rubber band, and you never know when it's going to snap. will be answered by the next available operator. Please stand by. Your service reps are overwhelmed with customer calls, faxes, and emails. Integrate the internet into your call center and go from providing customer support to creating customer delight. Discover all that's possible on the internet. Cisco Systems, empowering the internet generation. An American musical icon coming to a and &E. Neil Diamond, live by request. Call or email your request. Neil Diamond, live by request. Hosted by Mark McEwen, Saturday at 9, 6 Pacific on A&E. K Red Berry Cereal. Crunchy Sweet Flakes, now with slices of real strawberries, right in the box. Looking good, never tasted so great. Kellogg's Special K Red Berries. It's new. One part tulip. Two parts French vanilla. Add one whitewash. Mix one quart lazy afternoon. Stir in one cup sunshine and a pinch of fresh sand. Serves one or a family of six. Introducing Swedish Home by Ethan Allen. All the ingredients you need to make an elegantly simple home. a and &E's look at George Foreman continues on Biography. In October of 1968, 19-year-old George Foreman, who came from the poorest part of Houston, was a the athletes at the Olympic Games in Mexico City. George, the fighting corpsman as he called himself, survived his early bouts to become a gold medal contender. 
When I got a chance to really go to the Olympics, I knew then that I was the prime representative of the, of Amer of the American team. I knew that. In 1968, it was more complicated than ever to represent America. America was in the middle of the civil rights struggle. We were fighting for our freedom, equality, and justice for something that we all deserve to have, our freedom in this country. And so some people call it turmoil. I call it revolution. The revolution claimed its victims. In April, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, and the nation's capital went up in flames. In June, Robert Kennedy, the presidential candidate and an ardent advocate for social justice, was killed. The high hopes that great society programs would eliminate poverty and racism had turned to anger and frustration. And the Black Panthers, a radical separatist group, urged black athletes to protest by boycotting the Olympics. But George Foreman was unaware of the controversy until the American sprinters Tommy Smith and John Carlos raised their clenched fists in a black power protest. Their gesture was perceived as courageous by many African Americans, but as anti-American by many whites. The two athletes were dismissed from the Olympic Village. The episode put other black athletes in a dilemma. Reporters on the story were eager to know what George was going to do. Whatever he does, it will be a credit to him, a credit to his people, his race, also a credit to the world, whatever he does. At a time of high Cold War tension, George had to fight the Soviet heavyweight, Ionis Chapoulis, for the gold medal. And boy, we said, oh my goodness, he's fighting a Russian. First thing I thought of, if he beats the Russians, Russians going to drop a bomb on us. So quite naturally, I was afraid. I said, well, maybe he won't beat the Russian, and then it won't be a war. The Russian was by far the more accomplished boxer. Now we'll see whether or not the experience of the Soviet fighter shows. But experience counted for little against George's powerful punches. Oh, left, right first, then left, then another right. Good combination. The fight had to be stopped. George had Over won. To the corner, the technical term, referee stops contact. And now the spectators George were waiting Foreman. to see if he too was going to make an inflammatory gesture. Everybody was sitting there tensed. You hear a pin drop. And George, this now 19-year-old George Foreman, who's still a rookie, you know, he took out the little American flag and he bowed to all four sides. The whole place looked at. They shot the whole entire world, not just the United States, the whole entire world. George was now the big story. Photos of him were everywhere. We saw the picture in the, uh, in the newspaper with him waving that flag. George was Olympic heavyweight champion. And then I realized that if a bomb was going to be dropped, they would have dropped it. It hadn't happened. Very proud of him. You know, we couldn't believe that he really did something out of his life. For George, the gold medal was public proof of his achievement. It was his proudest possession. He showed it off so often and wore it so long that the ribbon had to be replaced. Now a symbol of patriotism, George was criticized by the radical black community and was called an Uncle Tom. But he was rewarded for his winning gesture with an invitation from President Johnson to visit the White House. The impossible kept happening. He was the father of this job corps. I remember uh, the President Johnson looking at me as if to say, look, I've given you the baton. <laughs> It had not been for the Job Corps, I was literally rescued from the gutter. In 1969, George announced his decision to turn professional, hoping one day to win the heavyweight championship with his awesome punch. A lot of people be afraid of me. He began to train with ex-champion and convicted felon Sonny Liston, known for his intimidating stare. I came to believe early on that George had acquired some of Sonny's characteristics directly from Sonny. He learned how to glower, and he learned how to punch. George, the charming, flag-waving Olympian, was now a career boxer with a new look and a sinister persona. George is doing his best imitation of Sonny Liston. All of a sudden, you have this stare coming at you. But George was that insecure which might be why he adopted that persona of that surly person, because he didn't know what he was. George